a life-changing experience. So, today, are you ready? Ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. So, we are here in, I guess it's winter time now, <laughs> and, and uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Florissant, if those of you watching online don't know where we're at, and it is quite cold today, and I'm not one who favors the cold weather, but I've got to prepare for it. And, you know, certain people, like my mother, loves the winter time. Uh, maybe not so much the cold, but the snow. I like the beautiful snow. But there's a lot to be said about preparing for new seasons in our life. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, preparing for a new season in your life. You know, we all get comfortable with certain seasons, right? The seasons we like, we get, and, and after we get set in there, like mine, I love the springtime, I love the fall time, but especially spring, it's just everything's coming alive, it's beautiful, and the weather's nice, uh, not too hot, not too cold. Um, and so I get used to that, and then all of a sudden, it just gets really hot. And then I'm like, oh, it's too hot outside. And then I get, uh, get used to the, the fall weather and everything's feeling great. And all of a sudden, oh, it's too cold, right? <laughs> After we got comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then when a new season comes, that means we've got to make some adjustments. Somebody has to winterize their house or maybe winterize their boat or their vehicles and we change our wardrobes and put things in storage and take things out of storage. Like we make changes because of the season that we're coming into. Now, some of us are a little late in preparations for certain seasons that we come into. And what happens when we're a little bit late in our preparations for those seasons that we're coming into? Now, right now, we're talking about these physical atmospheric seasons, but we have a spiritual, a spiritual set of seasons that we enter in in our life as well. We don't just go through the physical atmospheric seasons. And you may feel that sometimes you're on fire for Jesus, and then suddenly you have a cold season or a dry season. And you're like, what happened? It may seem that everything is going right for you and suddenly things start falling apart. You're in a different season. It may seem that everyone loves you and then suddenly you have a bunch of haters. What happened? We all go through different seasons of life, but how do we prepare for them? I like this scripture in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, still provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. She's preparing. The ant prepares for the future. This little creature that has more wisdom than some of us. <laughs> hmm. Did you notice in that scripture that the Bible uses the word wise when it's talking about considering the way of the ant. There's some wisdom in preparations. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we all know this very well. We've heard it many times, but I'm going to read it. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under the sun, or under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. 
a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Wow. So the question is, how do you prepare for those times? How do you handle those times, and are you ready for change? Because the Bible makes it very obvious to us that there's going to be change. There's going to be different seasons of our life that we enter into. So I already know that maybe one day I'm going to feel like everybody loves me, another day I feel like everybody hates me. I already get it. And it's already happened many times. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so that helps prepare you for the next season, the next time. You know, you might wonder in those scriptures, you know, um, the time to kill, we need time to kill. Talk the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Well, they're talking about murder. We're talking about, you know, by, the Bible says that God even helped with fighting wars, you know, uh, to take out the enemy um, for good reason, to protect the other people, the good people, like sometimes there's a time for it. Mm -hmm. But praise God, there's a time for healing. There's even a time for raising of the dead. Hallelujah. Yeah. And there's one that I remember that is the most important, which is Yeshua is raising from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 to 13 says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all remember the verse 13, the last one I just spoke, but sometimes we forget about verse 12. Mm -hmm. See, we have to know how to abound and how to abase. We need to know how to operate in this life with great increase and great poverty. Hmm. Let that sink in for just a moment, because I think some of us, we feel like, man, I'm going to be just fine as long as I have everything I need. What about just being fine, trusting the Lord when you don't have all the things that you think you need? Hmm. There's a time in the Bible where Jesus said he didn't have a place to lay his head. Meaning, having a comfortable home with a house and a bed and a, you know, like everybody else does. But maybe that's not what we think. That's not what we need. We just think we need it. Because God will provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But we do have to go through seasons. And think of the seasons that our Lord Yeshua had to go through. His season of upbringing as a child. We miss a lot of that in Scripture. It doesn't talk about it. We have a time when he was 12-year-old that... The scripture talks about, but then all of a sudden he's, you know, when he's an adult. So there's different seasons that he went through. And then even his ministry around 30 years old blew up and took off. And now the whole world knows about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But there was a time that they didn't. It wasn't the right season. And he had to be ready for the season when... It went from don't tell anybody what happened to you to now let's tell the whole world. Mm -hmm. There are seasons. And when the whole world finds out about you, are you ready for that? Most of us are not. A lot of people think, oh, it'd be so great to be popular and be on TV and have the shining lights, you know, like a movie star. And then you hear stories people wishing they had a normal life because the paparazzi is following them everywhere and it's so annoying they can't go anywhere. Michael Jackson is trying to hide his face, hide his kid's face and can't even go into a grocery store and that's a costume. I'm like, what kind of life is that? Most of us would not be ready right now for that kind of life. Most people are not ready for millions of dollars and destroy them. And that's the very reason they don't have it a lot of times. So do you know that some folks would feel like 
they're destroyed. Their life is just all falling apart if they lost everything. And when, you know, and when, when others would feel like it's just a big weight off their shoulders. So the one person feels like, oh, this is my, my life is just destroyed. Another person like, oh, finally, I feel free now. Why is that? I think the one was prepared and the other one was not. One of them's closer to the Lord and trusting in Him, and the other's not. See, some people that come into wealth, they lose everything because they did not know how to handle increase. I have known people personally. There's a lady that um, I bought a van from years ago that she uh, won the lottery, and she had millions of dollars, and she bought a brand new house in a gated community, and she bought all the, you know, brand new conversion van with the TV and the VCR back in the day, you know, it's all fancy and, and, um, nice vehicles. And she just thought, oh, I want to get rid of this one now. And it was beautiful. I bought it from her and her pride was very disappointing because when she sold it to me, I asked her, I said, is this, uh, did you buy this new or pre-owned? And she looked at me and said, you think I'd buy a pre-owned vehicle? Who do you think I am? Like it's a bad thing. Like her pride, like, I wouldn't buy something that somebody else used. Guess what? Within a matter of a couple years, she lost everything. A lot of people, their attitude's wrong. Their skill sets are wrong. Their heart is wrong. Maybe they don't deserve to have increase. We've got to become the person to be able to handle the next season in our life. Are you becoming that person that can handle the winter? Because winter is here. What about a spiritual winter when you feel like everything's, everything has died? It's cold. Where's the Lord? Anybody experienced that before? I have. I'm like, man, I felt so close to the Lord. Everything's great, you know, and God's using me. And then all of a sudden, I don't feel the anointing. I don't feel his presence. Like, oh, what happened? Sometimes it's because of our decisions that we've gotten ourselves into that season but sometimes it's because the Lord sees that we need to go through it. And we learn, need to learn how to pass tests. We need to learn how to prepare. Our mindset and faith play a big part in how we handle change. Did you get that? Our mindset and our faith play a big part in how we handle change. What is your mindset? What is your level of faith? So that when those changes in your life come, you're able to handle them. For example, I've had so many people in my life that have stabbed me in the back and hurt me. And so it's no longer a surprise to me if someone does that again. It's like, it's, ha it's like the story of my life. It's happened. I've given myself so much. I've loved people. I've tried to help people, encourage people, and I'm there for them. And then all of a sudden, they turn on me. So I'm not surprised anymore. So you've got to be ready for those seasons. We've got to learn how to conquer our feelings and our emotions when we get hurt by those that we love. It could cause us to go into a deep, dark depression if our faith is not in place. If we're not trusting in the Lord, if we're not close to Him. We have to stop relying on people and start relying on the Lord. Hmm. This is a big one. I want you to catch that. We've got to stop relying on people so much and start relying on the Lord because you know what? People are going to fail you. They will. Even those that you love, they're not perfect. 
people are not perfect, therefore they will fail you. And it doesn't mean that's even intentional. I probably fail you guys all the time, and I don't even know it. <laughs> I don't try to, right? Just like you don't try to, if you make a mistake, you fail somebody. But I can't tell you how many times I've heard, even just recently, where people say they don't go to church anymore because of an offense of another person. Well, I hear all the gossip in church, or I ain't like what that pastor said today, so I ain't going back. Well, did you ever stop to think that, first of all, you might be the one misunderstanding what the pastor said? Because that's been me several times. After I grew and matured, I look back and, oh, he was right, you know. Now I get it. And have you ever thought, stopped and thought that it's not about the people, but it's about the Lord? That we should keep our eyes on Jesus and not on people? See, we got to love God and love people, but sometimes people are depending too much on an imperfect imperfect human being instead of depending on a perfect God. You guys just are like in, like so silent today, like taking it all in, I guess. Or I'm boring you and you're falling asleep. One or the other. Hallelujah. <laughs> Trying to keep up on your notes. So many people have stopped even serving the Lord. Now they'll call themselves Christians. And they'll even pray. But they stopped serving the Lord because they blame it on others. Well, isn't serving the Lord about the Lord? Why do we blame others and then stop serving the Lord? See, they start focusing on the imperfections of man instead of focusing on the perfections of the Lord. If I go to a church and I hear somebody gossip, it doesn't make me... Now, I know the feeling, because years ago when I was a younger Christian, I, I felt the same thing. I, I remember going to a church and I seen people walk out the church and they're smoking cigarettes and stuff, and I'm like, what kind of church is it? What are they teaching these people here? But I didn't come, I didn't think to me, I didn't come to my mind that, well, maybe the pastor's teaching them the right way, but they're not perfect, and therefore they're just still making mistakes and... And, and, the, and the pastors being loving and forgiving and merciful and just trying to help them along their way. They're just not there yet. You ever think of that when people are gossiping in church? That maybe those people are just not spiritually mature enough yet? So don't, like, put your faith in them. Put your faith in God. Mm hmm. Mm. Yeah. Do you ever stop and think that maybe when you hear of something that you disagree with or don't understand from a pastor that instead of not coming back to that church, that you can actually have enough confidence and, and, and courtesy enough to walk up to the pastor afterward and say, sir, I was just wondering if you would help me understand this concept that you're teaching because, you know, I just don't get it because I, I was thinking this other way and maybe I'm wrong, so I'd like to understand more. Be the humble one, right? Because you may be wrong. And then maybe in his explanation, the Lord might speak to him and say, oh, you know what? Maybe they're right. Win-win. Whatever way, it doesn't matter, but at least you communicated about it, right? Mm -hmm. And just because he got one thing wrong doesn't mean he's got everything wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have everything right. You can stop coming to church just because I don't know 100% everything. <laughs> You're not going to go to any church, trust me, <laughs> if that's right. the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So do you understand that in most cases we have to go through hard times to learn how to handle stress and overcome stress and take victory over it, over these situations? Don't complain that you're going through something. Instead, rejoice. Amen? Oh, I don't like that. What do you mean I got to rejoice while I'm going through something? The Bible says give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God through Christ Jesus for you. Well, how can I give thanks in all things when all this junk happens in my life? I don't be thankful for that junk. I didn't say be thankful for it. I said be thankful in it. You're misunderstanding. You know, my, my, my arm is hurting right now. I'm not thankful that it's hurt, but I still rejoice and I lift my hands with that arm and worship the Lord with it. Amen. See? 
What is going to serve you well, serve you the best? If I complain about my arm or, it, 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 you know, and Lord, how come you ain't me yet? Is that going to serve me better? Or is it, Lord, I trust you no matter what and I worship you, you know, and think positive. Yes. We allow ourselves to get in this negative state of mind because we're focused on problems instead of focus on the answer. Hmm. What you focus on the longest becomes the strongest in your life. Now, Romans chapter 3. I'm sorry, chapter 5. I'm going to read a bit of scripture for you today. And come along for the ride. When I read you scripture, especially like when it's a little bit longer, I want to encourage you to block out all distractions even mirrors and stuff, block <laughs> all distractions and put yourself in the scripture, in the story and ask God to speak to you and give you revelation and understanding of his love letter to you. God loves you and he's written these things for you so that you will, you'll will understand and he'll, it'll, it'll, it'll change your life. It'll bless your heart. But if you ignore his letter to you, Man, I can't imagine, like, if I wrote a love letter to my daughter, sweetheart, I just love you so much, and I want to give you some, you know, tips on how to have a good future, good life, and and I try to read it to her, and she, I don't care about it, I don't care about it. Ouch! But you know how many times we do that to God? Wow. Romans chapter 5. Well, I'm going to read the longer stuff later. So this one's a shorter. Um, Romans chapter 5 verse 3 says, And not only this, but we also celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. So we celebrate in our tribulations. When we go through things, we can still rejoice, knowing that there's a benefit of going through it. When I go to the gym and I work out and my muscles are sore and it's hard, you know, I'm not going to complain like, this is too hard, I don't want to do it. No, I'm rejoicing that it's going to bring benefits to me. Make sense? Mm -hmm. How in the world do we celebrate in hard times? <laughs> this reminds me of a scene in Karate Kid. You remember in Karate Kid Part 3, after the bad guys destroyed the new bonsai shop that Daniel got for Mr. Miyagi, mm -hmm. and um, he gets in his truck with Daniel and he starts singing a happy song. You remember that? And he's like, how do you sing a happy song when this happened? I don't get it. And he goes, da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I love it. <laughs> or how about when he arrives back home and because his, his thing was, I'm in the truck. He's like, oh, I'm so happy they destroyed the shop. But I had all of our stock at home. So we still got that. So we'll just sell a few trees and then we'll be back in business. We'll be fine. And so he's like, da, 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 da. And then he gets home and he realizes that his bonsai trees are missing too. Now what? He grabs his fishing pole and he goes fishing. <laughs> That's a great attitude. Great attitude. What would we do? Probably like Daniel, you know. I'm not going to stand around and not do anything. I'm going to go and like take him out or something. You know, that's his mindset. <laughs> so what mindset do you have? Sing a happy song after the enemy attacks and steals your belongings? Or to complain about it and be ready to get revenge? Hmm. See, we've got to learn to look at the bright side of things. And I'm preaching to myself. You know I always do that. I say, if you get something out of it, that's great. I'm not perfect at this either. But, sh but we should be practicing every day. Amen? Mm -hmm. Practice makes improvement, not perfection. Mm -hmm. We're just improving day by day. Walking by faith, not by sight. That's what we need to practice. Thanking God for what we do have instead of worrying about what we don't have. Let that sink in. I'm going to say it again. We need to be thanking God for what we do have instead of worrying about what we don't have. Amen. 
Hallelujah. For example, if Brother Inslee watches, he missed church today, if he watches this online, you know, he's got to get hip surgery. It would be most advantageous to thank God for doctors that can do the surgery. Thank God that it's only his hip and not something more serious. Amen? Thank God that there'll be a time that he'll recover and feel much better. Amen? Amen. So what season of life are you in right now? What is God teaching you in this season? What do you need to do to prepare for the next season? See, that question right there is one I would write down and I would go meditate upon later. Because that is going to blow up to something bigger to help you handle what God has for you in the future. I believe we need to be resourceful, be ready for things to come. I also believe that we need to stick together because the Bible teaches us that two is greater than one and that we'll have a greater reward for our labor. It's not fun being out in the cold and freezing weather all by yourself. But when you have another body, you have some warmth. Amen? Amen. It's always good to have somebody there by your side. I believe that depending on how you prepare for the future season will determine how comfortable that you'll be when it arrives, how full you'll be, how protected you'll be. Still thinking about the ant that prepares. I want to share with you um, a spiritual season that we all need to be ready for. So important. Now, this is the long scripture. I want you to follow along with me. We all know that Jesus is coming back. So we know there's another very significant season in Scripture called the end times and the second coming. And um, we're going to read from Matthew 24. You ready? Stay along with me. I I feel the need to pray right now before we read it. Heavenly Father, in the name of Yeshua, Lord God, we just pray that as we read your word today, we speak to our hearts. We open our hearts. We want to hear a message from you. We want you to wake us up and help us to prepare for things to come. And we give you the glory for it. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Mm-hmm. Matthew 24. Here we go. You ready for the journey? Ready. Put yourself in this story because it's it's the season that we are coming into, if not into already. Jesus left the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. But he responded and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. He said, all this is going to be destroyed. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Lord, tell us when when will will these things happen and and what will be the sign of your, your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Oh, that's so powerful. We need that right there. Verse four, write it down, put it big. Don't forget it. See that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ, and they will mislead many people. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Hmm, We already hear of a lot of wars and rumors of wars. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Has that already happened? Mm Mm-hmm. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Hmm. All these things have to happen on earth. It's like giving birth to his coming. It's preparing for his coming. It's alerting us, warning us. 
Verse 9, then they will hand you over to tribulation and kill you. Wow, that sounds fun. And you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. Are you ready for that season? Are you ready to love those that hate you? Are you ready to be a shining light under the darkness? When people come and curse you out, slap you, tell you you're evil, tell you you're a hater because you're a Christian, they'll call you a hater as a Christian because we have standards, because we stand against sin. They don't understand that we love the sinner, but we hate the sin, just as God does. So they think that we hate the person, so they'll call us haters. Mm -hmm. Especially in the area of the LGBT community, mm -hmm. most significantly. Just because we hate the sin that the Bible very clearly is against, they'll think we hate the person. Not understanding that God loves them and we love them. We just don't agree with them and we, we want to help them because we know that they're in the wrong according to Scripture. Mm -hmm. hmm. Verse 10. And at that time, many will fall away and they will betray one another and hate one another. They'll fall away. Are you getting this? Because they're not going to be able to handle the tribulation. They're not going to be able to handle all those persecutors. And so they're going to say, okay, I'll give up my faith so that I can fit in with the world. Wow. And then they'll betray one another. Reminds me of the old movie, um, Thief in the Night. So there is this family and there is uh, one of the girls there. It was a Christian family, but this one, the one daughter, uh, she was acting like she was uh, a Christian. But then later, she actually um, went with the other side and betrayed her own family. Mm. Scary. 11. And many false prophets will rise up and mislead many people. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will become cold. But the one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. And you know what it's going to take for endurance? Preparation. Preparation. Just like preparing for a race. You're going to have to train to gain more endurance. It's the same thing in the spiritual realm. You have some spiritual training, some spiritual gymnastics, some spiritual martial arts that, that we need to do to prepare to, be in, to, to have endurance in the end times. Because there's going to be so much pressure. Think about the lady that has a baby. And, say, and they say, you can't buy or sell anything without the mark of the beast. It's like, what do I do? My baby's going to die. Should we take the mark and give our soul to Satan? So we can live a couple more years and then go to hell for the eternity, you know? So they feel they're going to feel that pressure like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? Because they love their baby. We got to love God more. Amen. Amen. It's not an easy, easy thing in those times for sure. But we got to prepare. Verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. So, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world. So, some people think that it has been preached in the whole world, that everybody's heard the gospel. I don't think there's any way to know that for sure, because nobody knows what's going on in every single part of the world. You just can't. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. We're not there. right? But the gospel has spread tremendously throughout the world. That doesn't mean in every place. But once it has, then the end shall come. And it doesn't mean the end shall come immediately thereafter, but the end shall come after that happens. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Isn't that amazing that they just stuck that in there? Let the reader understand. That means you better stop and pay attention to this, right? 
So the abomination of desolation, supposedly when the, the temple is rebuilt again, the third temple, that the false prophet or the, the Antichrist will go into the holy place and desecrate it. And that will be the abomination of desolation. It says in verse 16, Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must go, not go down to get things out of the house. And whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those women who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Moreover, pray that when you flee, it will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. Sounds pretty serious to me. The question is, when that season comes, are we going to be ready? And if those days had not been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or he is over there, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will provide great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance so if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is there, the vultures will gather. So we're going to see him coming in the sky. I mean, it's going to be pretty obvious when the Lord comes back. So we don't have to wonder, wait. Did I miss it? The Lord's over there? Well, let me go check him out. No, we're going to know. Don't follow the Antichrist on accident. Amen? Amen. But he did so many cool miracles. More like magic tricks, mm -hmm. illusions, false miracles to get people to believe. So we have to be aware, be wise. Hallelujah. And then verse 29, the glorious return says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days... Stay with me on the timeline here. That's very interesting. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky. Interesting. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth, earth will mourn. Did you notice that the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light and the stars fall from the sky and all this craziness, heaven shaking before he comes in the sky. That means if we're still around in those days, we're going to witness that. So, so then, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky, hallelujah, with power and great glory. Yeah. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Hallelujah. Now listen to the parable of the fig tree. Verse 32. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. As soon as its branch be, has become tender and sprouts its leaves, you know that summer is near. There's a season. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Prepare for that season. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Verse 36, but about the day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. And, will, and so will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
At that time, there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other one will be left. Two men will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and the other one left. Therefore, be on the alert, ready for that season. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night that the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this season, you must be ready as well and prepared for the season. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think that he will. Hmm. I believe that we will know the seasons because the scriptures tell us the season right there when these things are going to happen. It gives us a timeline of things that happen. We'll know the season, but we won't know the day. Hmm. We won't be in darkness about the season. God is going to reveal. And as a matter of fact, I kind of believe that he's going to like give us a little hints that any day now, like really, really soon, but maybe not the exact day, but really like get ready, here it comes. That's how I feel about it personally. <laughs> Verse 45. Who then is the faithful and sensible uh, servant whom his master put in charge of his household servants to give them their food at the proper time? Mm. Mm, 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 mm. That sounds like that's for me. <sighs> Blessed is that servant whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and he begins to beat his fellow servants, and he eats and drinks with those habitually drunk, then, he ma then the master of that servant will come on a day that he does not expect, and at an hour that he does not know, and he will cut him in two and assign him a place with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. So, my question is, will you be ready for those times? Many believe that we are already in these times. And if so, it's only obviously going to get worse, according to the timeline we see in Scripture. But the cool thing is, as believers, guess what? We don't have to fear. Amen. We don't have to walk in fear. We walk in faith, believing and knowing that to live is Christ, to die is gain. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Yes. Like, hey, heaven's a great place. You kill me, I'm going there. I'm all good. And, you know, I'm blessed because I died for the Lord. Yes. And if I get to stay here, I get to share the gospel and change people's lives for the better. But the negative person, oh, man, I got to go through all this mess on earth, all these trying times. Man, I don't want to die, and I don't even know if I'll go to heaven. I might end up in hell. What if there is not a heaven? What, you know, what if I'm just in the ground the whole time and I'm just dead? Like, they're just thinking negative all the time. Instead of believing the scriptures, and walking by faith, thinking about good things, expecting good things. Amen. And if we prepare properly for the next season, for things to come, we can go into that season with confidence. Think about it. Even here in this physical world, in this physical world, I'm even in a position right now with my vehicles, my personal life. I don't feel like I'm ready yet for the snow. I got to get ready. Because I don't want to wait until afterwards. And then I'm like, no, there's snow in my nice car. And I, I you know, I don't want it to get rusted and all this stuff. And now I got to drive this vehicle in the snow. And I don't have a proper vehicle for the snow. Like, I got to get ready. I'm not perfect. I'm not ready yet. I'm just transparent. I'm not ready yet. So hopefully I don't snow yet. <laughs> but I need to get ready. Yes. Sometimes the busyness of life keeps us 
from our preparations. Mm -hmm. And it makes it difficult. And sometimes we just do what feels good in the moment instead of take care of the tough things that are not as pleasing and therefore we don't get ready. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel sometimes. So I encourage everybody to write down a list. What is the next season to come? Or even what season am I in? Am I already yet? For the season I'm already in. What am I doing in this season? And then what am I doing in this season to prepare for the next season? This is the reason I wear this shirt today. It kind of represents spring, everything coming to life. So during the winter time, I want to prepare for my next season. But I need to be ready for this season as well. So are you ready for winter? Because we're already in it. Are you ready for spring? Are you ready for the blessings that God brings into your life in this next season when things just start to grow and increase in your life? Are you going to be ready for those? Or is it going to be too hard to handle like that millionaire that lost everything? We have to enlarge our capacity to receive more from God. To be ready for the next season of our life. Amen? Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for alerting us and warning us about things to come. Help us to prepare to be wise like the ant. And... Um, Help us to trust in you with all of our heart. Lean not on our own understanding. To keep our eyes on you, not on people, not on circumstances, but to trust in you. Thank you for wisdom, for understanding, for insight, for revelation of your word. Help us to be alert and not distracted by the things of this world. Not pulled away by feelings and emotions and our own selfish desires. Help us to focus on your will and what you want, Lord, so that we can be ready for things to come. Mm -hmm. We thank you for it. We give you the glory for it. In the name of Yeshua, we love you. Amen. 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 Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for being here. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you real soon again. Be blessed.